Okay, well, at the beginning of the First World War, soldiers deployed to theatres other than the Western Front suffered because of lack of planning, which in turn was the product of deeply flawed, over-optimistic, and frankly, irresponsible strategic decision-making. Well, whereas the deployment of the BEF to France, which of course carried out in uh, 19, August 1914, had been meticulously planned before the war, uh, France and Belgium were modern states with developed infrastructure, but neither of these things were true about the campaigns launched in the Persian Gulf in 1914 or, or Gallipoli in 1915, which saw hastily assembled expeditionary forces sent off to hostile, undeveloped area after minimal planning. Improvisation was the order of the day and lacking the generally impressive logistic, transport and medical support that was available on the Western Front, troops suffered accordingly. So the fact that uh, Egypt was already uh, a significant British base was, I think, important in the desert operations in Sinai and the Levant in 1915-18. And this too po uh, points up a difference between these uh, theatres. should actually say that this is part of a chapter in the book I'm writing at the moment, looking at the experience of British and Dominion troops in the two world wars. And so I will fairly frequently be sort of zooming in, in on the experience of the ordinary soldiers. Okay, well, all of this is not simply uh, a case of, ind of individuals displaying incompetence, although it actually is uh, uh, true up to a point. Talk about people displaying incompetence. Got to work out how to shift my slide. Done it. Okay. Right. Um, as Andrew Syke has argued persuasively in the case of the Indian Army in Mesopotamia, though I think his point is applicable more widely, there were serious shortcomings in the structure of command. These resulted in poor cooperation and coordination between operational planning and logistic reality, and led commanders to downplay the importance of intelligence and logistics. And all this was exacerbated by adherence to a leader as warrior style of command, when modern conflict, especially trench warfare, demanded war managers, whose role to a large extent was uh, involved with the allocation of resources and decision making based on the assessment of intelligence. And this was actually, I think, captured very well by a journalist who accompanied the troops in Mesopotamia, Edmund Candler. His two volumes, The Long Road to Baghdad, are uh, a, a very interesting read even today. And he said that the good old days when the general advanced with his troops and indicated with the, with the point of attack, with a wave of his hand, are no more. His business is with maps and wires in a screen tent. He is the brain, not the pulse of the machine. In the meanwhile, the regimental officer may see what he sees, but he must listen to the distant voice at the end of the wire. So this is a very, very different form of command, indeed, of, of battle from the more traditional version, which you, know, you can pitch back to the American Civil War 50 years before the First World War, or indeed the Napoleonic Wars uh, uh, 100 years before. And what we see in the first few years of the First World War, I think is a really important break in tradition. Command now is something different. And the problem is that not all commanders were up to the task of adjusting to the change. And spoiler alert, one of the big themes coming out of my paper tonight is the way that early on commanders failed on these really, really basic things. And they were replaced by more modern commanders who might have the same sort of bushy moustaches, but nonetheless, they were war managers who understood the way that command, the way that war had changed. Well, one who I think personified the old style uh, type of command was Lieutenant General Sir John Nixon, who was the commander in Mesopotamia at the beginning of the 
of, of, of the campaign in 1914, 1915. And he was, if you like, uh, an old-style commander, uh, an overgrown regimental officer who paid insufficient attention to intelligence and logistics. And he was incredibly hands-on commander. He had the very unpleasant, if you were a subordinate, uh, habit of turning up at the headquarters of his operational commander and basically breathing down his neck during operations. The 1917 Mesopotamia Commission, a parliamentary commission which uh, dug into the reasons for the setbacks and the failures in the Mesopotamian campaign. He st they st it stated that the responsibility for making the respective advances with insufficient transport and for military reverses, the discomfort of the troops, the abnormal suffering of the sick and wounded, which resulted from such insufficiently attaches primarily to General Nixon. But though grave blame must be attached to Sir John Nixon for his excessive optimism, those who shared in the optimism cannot be wholly free from criticism. Now, this is fair up to a point. Nixon and others were certainly culpable, but he and others were the product of a system, if you like, victims of a system with defects that were laid ruthlessly bare in Mesopotamia. Well, soldiers' accounts of the early stages of the Mespot campaign reveal a litany of suffering. And it's a, basically is the result of an under-resourced army conducting a shoestring operation in a land that was woefully lacking in modern infrastructure and the failure of British commanders to cut their cloth accordingly. As I'm sure we all know, initially, Ottoman resistance was weak and the port of Basra was seen very, seized very quickly in November 1914. And this led to a classic example of what today we would call mission creep. That is, uh, the commanders on the ground and indeed uh, people back uh, in, in India at this earlier stage, uh, the high command, were emboldened by this um, apparent, the apparent ease of the seizure of Basra uh, to push on. And so what had been initially a rather limited campaign of simply seizing the top of the Persian Gulf then became by stages an attempt to uh, occupy Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq, and defeat the Ottoman forces there. Well, initially, a combination of uh, enemy weakness and tough fighting delivered a series of military successes, but this was a success that was based on flimsy foundations. It was a small force operating a very long way from its base on highly tenuous lines of communication. Not nearly enough was done to improve the base facilities at Basra, where ships were anchored and then manually loaded, uh, unloaded onto small sailing vessels. Numbers of uh, riverine craft were pitif pitifully inadequate, and not much effort was made to acquire more, although the rivers Euphrates and Tigris, in the absence of roads, were the main supply routes. Medical support was likewise um, scandalously deficient, and we can draw some very obvious parallels here with Gallipoli. But in spite of all these factors, Nixon's uh, troops struck inland, and on encountering tougher Ottoman resistance, the House of Cards collapsed. The Anglo-Indian force was besieged at Kut at the end of 1915. A force was sent to relieve Kut. It was bad, badly hampered by heavy casualties, transport failures, and lack of surprise, supplies. And the surrender of Kut in April 1916 had its roots in catastrophic command failures, not least the basic necessity of getting the logistics right. Well, the extent to which these failures shaped the ordinary soldiers' experience of the Mespot campaign can be traced through the contemporary letters of Captain the Honourable Robert Palmer. Now, he was the second son of the Earl of Selborne, and despite his aristocratic heritage and being the son of a prominent politician, uh, uh, Palmer was a pre-war officer in his local territorial battalion, the 6th Hampshire's. It was uh, a, a, an unfashionable county regiment rather than, than the guards, cavalry or, or green jackets. Well, he was sent with his battalion to India 
1914, and in the following year was posted to the first four Hampshires in Mesopotamia, arriving in August 1915. And he wrote home from Ashar, a small port about three miles from Basra, um, saying he was able to appreciate the most fascinating side of Ashur Creek, the main thoroughfare, as crowded with boats as Henley at a, regret, at a regatta. This, of course, is evidence of the inadequacy of Basra as a base. Palmer was by no means a natural rebel. Of course, he's a part of the establishment. But he was quickly angered by what he described as the murderous folly of military authorities. When leaving uh, India, the troops were forbidden to take their spine pads. Now, these were pieces of padded cloth worn on the back, which was thought, quite wrongly, to give protection against sunstroke. They were taken away because they would be issued in Basra. Naturally, when they arrived, there were none available. The arrival of the draft took everybody in Mesopotamia's surprise, including the battalion to which Palmer was destined. And he goes on about the way that the troops were, were messed around. Uh, they had to wait uh, for ages under a burning sun to transfer them to, uh, um, uh, to floating, flo floating barracks. Um, two barges turned up at no notice, having what, troops been waiting for some time. Then got just 90 minutes to complete the embarkation. The troops hadn't been fed. You get the picture. It just went on and on and on. The barges had no cover, being as open as rowboats. It was 102 degrees in my cabin. So you can imagine what the heat and glare of 150 men in open barge was. Um, the journey was all of 600 yards, and it took several hours to complete. The poor men finally got some food at 2 p.m. after a 22-hour fast and three hours herded or working at a temperature of about 140 degrees. Of the 49 under his command, three suffered from sunstroke there and then, and the four went sick the following day. Now, as an officer, Palmer was able to cope better than other ranks. On his floating hotel, he would strip naked, sponge himself with water, and stand in front of a fan. While you're wet, it's deliciously cool, but this was not an option open to the rank of file. Now, all of this smacks of the uh, hurry up and wait familiar to anyone who has dealt with a military organization. But it's one thing to be messed around at Sandhurst in a, in a Berkshire spring, quite another to undergo in the heat of a Persian Gulf summer. Now, leaving individual incompetence aside, Palmer's account, <laughs> excuse me, is sad testimony to grossly inadequate base facilities and a defective logistic system struggling to cope with demands pl placed upon it. And this was nearly nine months after the British had occupied Basra. Now, Palmer's denunciation of the authorities as criminal, scatterbrained nincompoops about fit to look after a cocker spaniel between them can only be criticised in his regard for canine welfare. Well, from Basra, Palmer and his draft proceeded up, land, up inland up the Tigris on a river, river steamer. He found that his battalion, the 1st 4th Hampshires, was down from 800 men to about 100 effectives. Uh, and his men, having arrived very soon, fell victim to the lassitude and a general sickness, which, which was pretty, pretty endemic. He said that men took two or three weeks to, to recover from mild, uh, mild, minor ailments. Even the supposedly healthy were listless and when off duty, they just lay about. When I see men larking or bathing, it's generally some of the new drafts. Now, this is a picture of an army that's doing very little fighting at this stage, this battalion anyway, but is in a very, very, uh, poor state. Okay, well, let's now say something about conditions on campaign. Uh, recounting action at Kerner in December 1914, Lieutenant Shake, Shakeshaft, <laughs> excuse me, the second Norfolk's commented, as so often happens in our campaigns, we had sent inadequate force for the job. 
Now, this was true on so many levels, and I'll just look at just one, that is medical provision. In his diary, Sheikh Shaf noted the action at Shaiba in April 1915. As usual, in all our battles, we had no ambulances. Instead, wounded were sent back to camp on carts. Now, this might sound innocuous. Uh, sorry, should have seen that. Onto this one. Uh, this might sound innocuous enough, but conveying wounded men in unsprung carts inflicted terrible suffering on the victims. As one who endured it, Private Edward Rowe of the 6th East Lancashires noted sarcastically, it was the divine form of transport over rough ground. Shakeshaft wrote of a similar process of evacuating the wounded on transport carts during the Battle of Sassafon, 22nd of November 1915. The wretched wounded had to suffer hellish agonies, jolting over the uneven ground. She should never forget the sight of one poor fellow with a compound fracture in the leg trying to sit or hang onto a limbered wagon. One of the wounded, Captain Allen of the 66th Punjabis, who had been shot through the neck, stated that much extra suffering was caused by the means of conveyance from Sassifon to the riverbank by government transport carts. He heard many men shouting out with pain. Captain Heath of the 19th Punjabis, who was wounded in March 1916 in the course of attack, uh, found the mule carts unbearably painful to avoid undue suffering. I rejoined my unit and marched 15 miles distant, in spite of his left arm being shattered by a bullet which ended up lodged in his back. An adequate fleet of motor ambulances or properly sprung ambulance wagons would have made a great deal of difference. Now, in the aftermath of 6th Indian Division's attack at Sessafon in November 1915, there was something like 3,500 British and Indian wounded, which was far more than the military authorities had estimated and therefore were prepared to handle. In the words of B.T. Reynolds, uh, a Royal Artillery officer who was present, the four filled ambulances with the force with personal equipment to deal with 400 cases only found themselves with an impossible task. The work of the medical officers was beyond all praise, but the majority of the wounded had perforce to remain unattended and shift for themselves, plus adding materially to the general confusion and the difficulties of reorganization. So the complaint is not really against the medical personnel, just the inadequate resourcing of the medical side. And again, it's worth making parallels with the Western Front. Um, as a rule of thumb, the further east you went on campaign, the smaller your chance of being killed or wounded by enemy action, uh, the greater your chance of dying of disease or dying of wounds that you'll be safe from on the Western Front. On the Western Front, obviously, your chances of being killed or wounded by, by shell or machine gun bullet were much higher, but your chances of surviving a wound uh, and indeed of sickness, probably not getting sickness in the first place, were much, much higher. And so in many ways, what was happening in the Mesopotamian campaign uh, was more akin to the Crimean War in the 1850s in medical terms than it was to what was happening to their counterparts, uh, men of the same regiment but different battalions serving on the Western Front. Well, there was an obvious and in principle straightforward way of evacuating mass casualties, and that of course was by river. But here, as in so many other areas, there were insufficient resources. Captain Kirsch, of the Royal Engineers was lightly wounded in February 1916, and he was and is evacuated uh, by river the following day. There were full, there were few casualties that day, it seems, and all went smoothly. But in his evidence to the Mesopotamian Commission, uh, Kish contrasted his experience with the appalling arrangements for evacuating the wounded, as he said, at the Battle of Ehana a month earlier. On the day after the battle, it came across five carts full of wounded stuck in the mud. 
Among them was Lieutenant Perry of the 1st 4th Hampshires, so uh, Palmer's battalion. Perry was severely wounded and had spent about 16 hours drenched to the skin by the time I got, got into the camp. The suffering of the wounded on this occasion, when a large number died through exposure, Kish concluded, is attributable to the lack of suitable river craft. And without laboring the point too much, you're going to operate in Mesopotamia, modern day Iraq, where the two main uh, channels of, of communication are by river. You want to launch an offensive when you have sufficient river craft to move men up and move wounded back. Not only were there too few uh, vessels, river vessels, but those that were available had scant facilities that were all too often overwhelmed. Private Edward Rowe was relatively lightly wounded in April 1916 and sent off down the Tigris on the seam of P3. In his diary, he wrote of the dreadful things he saw. Men who are badly wounded are in some cases suffering from dysentery. Sanitary arrangements are non-existence. The wants of nature are relieved by the simple process of two men holding a sick or badly wounded man over the sides of the barges or steamer, the sides of which are encrusted with excretion. In some cases, wounded have not been properly dressed since we came aboard with the result that they are turning putrid. And if anybody wants a stomach churning uh, research project for an MA dissertation or something like that, a comparison of the medical facilities at Mesopotamia with those in the Crimea in 1854-55, I think would make a very interesting case study. Well, this sadly was not a one-off, as the evidence that Major Carter of the Indian Medical Service gave to the Mesopot Commission shows. <laughs> he witnessed the arrival of one boat at Basra, bearing Indian and British fighting, uh, uh, an Indian and British wounded from the fighting Sesophon. Uh, when the boat came, came close, it looked as though it's festooned with ropes. The stench when she was closer was quite definite. But I found out what I mistook for ropes were dried stalactites of human feces. I hope you've all had your tea. Um, even at a distance of more than a century, this passage, and I'll skip over the rest, uh, has not lost its power to shock. To summarize where we are, the inadequacy of the medical services in Mespot reflected a deeper malaise, a slapdash, shoestring approach to war, neglected planning, and the hard realities of campaigning. The heavy casualties and post battle chaos at Sesiphon may well have been persuasive, decisive in persuading Major General Charles Townsend, 6th Indian Division, to take counsel of his fears. He did not press any further attacks, but the Ottoman army had suffered badly and uh, its commander had been unnerved by British assaults. Instead, Townsend ordered his force retreat to cut. Townsend's momentous decision, heavily influenced by the appalling inadequacies of the army of Mesopotamia that was starkly revealed by the battle, shaped the fate of many other soldiers in the months to come. One was Captain Robert Palmer. He was killed in the Battle of El Hanna on 21st of January 1916, serving in the force that was attempting to lift the siege of Kut. Okay, to sort of um, lift the mood, if, if we can, um, I'll now say something about what was happening in Egypt at the same sort of time. Now, Mark Harrison, who has written the best book <laughs> on uh, British medicine in the First World War, the Medical War, uh, published uh, in 2010, has written, of all the campaigns conducted outside the West, Western Europe, the Palestine campaign of 1917-18 was by far the most impressive from a medical point of view. And one of the main reasons for this uh, is, if I can make the slide work, this man, of course, um, General Sir Edmund Allery, uh, Allenby, who was commander in chief of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, the EEF, from June 1917 onwards. So I think he deservedly uh, gets much of the credit. 
he played uh, close attention to health and hygiene, ensuring that medical factors were taken into account when planning operations, as was the norm in France. And here I think we can make a comparison between Allenby and his great rival Haig, who, whatever you might say about him as an operational commander, understood very well the importance of getting the medical side right and actually paid uh, great attention to it. And even Sir John French, uh, in no one's book, one of the great commanders of history, or even of the First World War, War, and yet French too understood the importance of medicine. And between them, the two commanders, uh, commanders in chief of the BEF, uh, French and Haig, uh, did an awful lot to make sure that the medical side of the campaign worked well. And Allenby did the same. It's also worth uh, giving some credit to Allenby's predecessor, uh, Archie Murray, who, uh, again, not one of the world's greatest commanders in operational terms, but actually he paid some decent attention to logistics and the medical side, about which I'll say a little bit more later on. OK, uh, what Allenby did, I think, when he arrived in Palestine in the late spring of 1917, like so much else involving Allenby, was to uh, put, put, put uh, booster rockets under what was already going on. Uh, he wasn't called the bull for nothing, as in bull in a china shop. He was a man who could be pretty terrifying as he rampaged around uh, sorting stuff out, but no one could deny he was an efficient commander. Um, and when he came in, uh, he uh, basically uh, supercharged the vigorous and effect and successful anti-malaria campaign in Egypt, uh, which was already already going on. Now the problem was that in 1914 to uh, 1916, the British had been largely campaigning over territory. Uh, of which the logistics weren't too bad. Uh, Egypt had been uh, under British control since the 1880s, and they weren't really venturing into unknown enemy territory until they crossed into Palestine, then part of the Ottoman Empire in, the, in early 1917. And once they moved into this, this territory, malaria cases rocketed um, because the, the Ottomans, for all sorts of reasons, had not paid the same sort of attention. Uh, Allenby uh, reflected in the second half of 1918, when of course they advanced even further into Ottoman, previously Ottoman held territory, that I had the mosquitoes well in hand, but now I'm in Turkish territory, malignant malaria is laying a lot of people by the heels. But in general, careful logistic, uh, attention to logistics medical support helped ensure that the soldiers of the EEF were spared the worst undergone by, undergone by their counterparts in Mesopotamia. Well, if there was one place in Mespot that did threaten to replicate, um, so one place in Palestine that did threaten to replicate Mesopotamia, it was the Jordan Valley. It was described by one British soldier as that unnatural hollow 1250 feet below sea level. See if I get this right. This plate of place of sweltering sun, sand spouts, scorpions, snakes, spiders, and septic sores of scorching wind and shuttleless waste, that hellish place, the Jordan Valley. Now there were good logistic, strategic reasons why, in the summer of 1918, Allenby should order that this area be held by the Desert Mounted Corps. Thus, British, Anzac, Caribbean, and Indian soldiers came to be stationed in an area where the average temperature was in July 1918, 113.2 Fahrenheit, with 130 Fahrenheit being recorded in one place. Winds whipped up powder-like sand into towering dust devils. Unlike the dry heat of the desert, water evaporating from the Dead Sea meant that the air contained moisture. And at that depth below sea level, as one veteran commented, the increased air pressure induces a feeling of lassitude against which it is difficult to fight. Not surprisingly, under these conditions, sickness among men and animals climbed alarmingly. 
All kinds of fever became rampant, particularly malaria. Men would suddenly become sick or collapse in a fainting fit, their temperatures quickly rising to 104 degrees or thereabouts. Doctors and medical orderlies were much overworked, became almost unable to cope with the rush. Men had to be, <coughs> excuse me, undressed, tended on the spot by their own comrades who sponged them down in order to reduce their temperature. That was the comment of one soldier who was there. Was well, summer in the uh, Jordan Valley threatened to undermine troop morale. Effective leadership at all levels was vital in keeping the problem under control. As much work as possible was done early in the morning and the evening and in the evening before the heat became too fierce. Unlike Gallipoli, three years later, salutary discipline was good. There were effective sanitary sections and excretion was disposed of by burning and there was enough physical space to ensure that the train trenches were not overwhelmed. So dysentery was not a major challenge. I'm sure this audience will be uh, uh, thoroughly aware of the problems uh, of, uh, of sanitation at Gallipoli. Basically, the British Army had a, had a very well worked out sanitation system that they went to war with in 1914. But it depended on the idea that they would be moving on uh, frequently. Therefore, you could always fill in the latrine pit and, you know, deal 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 with it with lime or what have you. But basically, when you're in the same place for nine months and, and the latrine uh, pits uh, get 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 filled up, it's a, a vicious cycle of men falling ill with dysentery and contributing to the problem, and and so on and so forth. The biggest challenge of all in the Jordan Valley was endemic malaria, but it was, in, in count, it was countered by an intensive campaign that involved everyone from medical personnel to the humblest trooper. Vigorous anti-mosquito measures were taken, recorded in an NCO of the Royal Gloucestershire Hussars. Every available man was employed on this work. And uh, I won't go into much more detail about this. Should, should we say that uh, each brigade had a brigade malarial officer who was trained in all, all aspects of malarial prevention, diagnosis and treatment. And they in turn trained up a total of 36 anti-malarial squads, each of 16 to 13 men. And these guys basically went around mosquito breeding areas. Um, they drained pools, swamps, irrigation channels and the like. Now this was not popular work to put it mildly, but it was recognised as being essential. It involved, as one Australian soldier put it, weeks of backbreaking toil in the gruelling heat, with many dropping as the fever grips them while is at work. All those little winding waddies provide innumerable backwashes of still water, havens for the mosquitoes. All have to be straightened out, so there is no stationary water to provide breeding grounds. Okay, what we see here is very, very detailed attention to uh, hygiene, which involved everybody from the CNC and um, Allenby described this as his war against mosquitoes, right down to, to, to the humblest soldier. Everybody understood why it was important, so everybody got stuck in, maybe not cheerfully, but but they knew what needed to, to, to do. I think at this stage, it's worth drawing obvious parallels with a slapdash approach in the early days uh, in Mesopotamia. I think what we can say is that for a start, someone like Allenby was on an altogether different level as a commander from Nixon, as in he as a thorough professional, understood his job, he made it his job to understand every aspect of campaigning. It also involved quite detailed and uh, quite complicated planning uh, carried out by good staffs to get everything right. Point about all this is that Allenby was aware if he wanted to carry out his bigger strategic plan, which involved advanced from the Jordan Valley, he had to keep the troops fit 
in order to carry it out. Therefore, you had to go to this level of detail. So what we see here, I think, is partly it's a case of a simply a much better commander. But it's not just about individuals, it's also about systems. And it's about an army which is approaching, if it's not already reached, maturity. The sort of, let's wing it, charge off into the unknown, we allow the logistics to catch up attitude of 1914 and 1915 had been replaced by uh, an approach that's grounded in logistics, it's grounded in understanding of the importance of the medical side, and frankly, it's grounded in a hard-won experience in the East and on the Western Front that if you want to conduct war properly, you need to do so by putting the utmost of planning into it. So it's about individuals. It's also about a maturing army. It's about staff work. And it's about a much more effective system. So malaria was not eradicated but it was reduced to manageable proportions and so when Allenby's final offensive against the Ottomans was launched in September 1918 uh, the troops that were fighting their way out of these horrible area were not crippled by malaria the battle against the mosquito was expensive in manpower and treasure uh, but to quote the um, the Australian uh, official medical history this sum large as it is, was a small one to pay for the subsequent smashing victory of the Turks, which would have been impossible if the anti-malarial work had not been carried out. So all of this stuff is now dropping into place. And I think the buy-in of the ordinary soldiers, recognising why they are doing this, why this is important, I think is absolutely key. Before we go back to Mesopotamia, it's, I think it's also worth pointing out some of the work that was done in Egypt and Sinai uh, before Allenby arrived in theatre. As I already said, the, the British had been in Egypt since 1882, and so there was something of a base with uh, reasonable infrastructure, but it was vastly expanded in 1914 and 1915. It helped that the British were on the defensive in this theatre. Of course, the Ottomans launched um, some attacks in 1915 and in 1916 across Sinai, which were batted off uh, quite easily. But the British did really not go on to the offensive until uh, late 1916. And when they did so, they made sure that they built uh, a pipeline to keep them in supply by carrying water and also by building a road, uh, a road made out of wire mesh laid across the stand. The latter recorded, uh, the, 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 the wire mesh road uh, was recorded by British soldiers being astonishingly effective. The sensation is almost that of walking on a hard macadamized road. It wasn't suitable for horses, whose horses uh, hooves damaged the wire. And as an appreciative soldier wrote, it took nearly two years of patient endeavor to get the logistics in place for a major um, offensive was possible. It was a colossal task, the magnitude of which was never even imagined by the people at home. Again, this actually was, um, I think he was a junior officer. It's interesting to see that you know, low-level soldiers uh, buy in to the logistic input of in, uh, in in Palestine. They can actually see the benefits from it, and of course, many of them had been involved in humping and dumping and digging in in in, in, in the in the process. So this meant that, unlike in nineteen fourteen to nineteen sixteen. Operations in Sinai and Palestine, Palestine were governed by logistics. And to wrap this bit up before we return to Mesopotamia, it's worth saying that the campaigns fought in 1917-1918, the three battles of Gaza and, and so on, they were no bed of roses for, for the participants. Uh, Anywhere where you were fighting the First World War was hard and 
that was no exception in Palestine. But, and this is a very big but, for the British Empire participants, British, Australian, New Zealand, uh, Caribbean, and Indian, they were largely spared the avoidable horrors of Mesopotamia in 1916-1917. By 1917, British imperial armies were reaching maturity, as I have already mentioned. And all of this had a really important and positive impact on the experience of soldiers in the field. And this is also true in Mesopotamia. The surrender at Kut in April 1916 is, in many ways, I think we can see as, as, as the worst defeat of the, British, of the British Army, British Empire in the entire First World War. Um, partly because it was unnecessary, they shouldn't have been there in the first place. Uh, all manner of mistakes were made during the siege. Um, and of course, for the British to lose an army to uh, a Muslim army, the, the Ottoman army, uh, was exceptionally important given that the British army, sorry, the British Empire had literally millions of Muslim subjects and of course a, a a decent chunk of the british indian army were actually muslims so this had enormous uh, ramifications yeah we can discuss in the questions afterwards whether this is better or worse than gallipoli or any others but it, it, it it's it's very important hence get overlooked because it happened only a few months before the battle of the battle of the somme but nonetheless i think it's significant in its own right now Two factors, uh, or, or I should say there are two consequences of the defeat at Kut. First of all, that uh, in this period, we saw the transfer of uh, authority for running the campaign go from India to London. So basically, it had been an Indian army affair run out of, of New Delhi. It's transferred to London and war office. That makes a big difference, a big and positive difference. And the second thing is that you start to get the really highly competent uh, soldiers appointed to command. Uh, and Lieutenant General Sir Stanley Maud is appointed as Commander-in-Chief of the Mesopotamia Expeditionary Force in August 1916. And he was a man who had, had, had formed, but in a good way, he, of course, had commanded the 13th Division, I, I think, at, at, at Gallipoli, and certainly in earlier, he'd been divisional commander in Mesopotamia, and he'd proven himself to be a highly competent commander. Previously, as a divisional commander in Mespot, he had complained privately that no one in this cursed force know, knows where to begin. But fortunately, when he was put into place as a commander-in-chief, uh, he was shown to be the exception. As Commander-in-Chief, he immediately recognised that the crux of the whole question was one of supply and transport. And his plan was simple, to place our communications from the base onwards on an absolutely sound and sure footing. That done, machinery should move like clockwork and half the difficulties of manoeuvring and mobility at the front will be overcome. Do not get this right, and the whole structure is bound to collapse like a pack of cards. Now, several points make about this. Of course, he was absolutely right. The second point is this should have been blindingly obvious to Maud's predecessors, but they chose to ignore it, to, 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 to turn a blind eye to it. Um, the most generous thing I think we can say is that these were, these were commands of the old school, focused on leading from the front, not worrying too much about the managerial uh, part of command. If uh, that had ever been uh, a viable method of command, I'm not convinced it was, it certainly was not true in the First World War. And Maud proved to be a really excellent mix of shrewd operational commander, but a man who understood the logistics and the management side of, of an army. 
So by February 1917, he's able to write that the military success achieved was very largely due to the splendid work that's been put in on the lines of communication. Nothing could have been better than the transport arrangements whilst the supply situation speaks uh, for itself. The medical uh, situation also improved dramatically, but disease in this theatre was always a problem. Indeed, Maud himself died of cholera in December 1917. His replacement, sorry, I've gone one too far, uh, his replacement was uh, Lieutenant General Sir William Marshall, another highly competent commander who basically who actually showed his his metal as a brigade commander at Gallipoli. Uh, very switched on man. And he took over from Maud and he was the man who saw the campaign out successfully uh, uh, through, through 1918. And Marshall himself wrote, he could not think of anyone other than Maud who could have, could have raised the morale of a force which in April 1916 was practically defeated to such remarkable heights uh, 12 months later. Actually, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that that's true, simply because you don't need to necessarily to be terribly charismatic or a great leader in that sense. If you put someone in place who actually starts to get things right so people are not dying necessarily, un unnecessarily, that they're being fed properly, that logistics are working, that the hospitals are running, that of the very essence uh, will help to increase morale. But back to, Mar back, back to, to Maud, uh, Marshall paid tribute to Maud's mastery of the three main principles of war, organization, strategy, and tactics. And Maud, of course, was extremely important, but the transformation of an army was a team effort, allied to the arrival of greater resources in theatre, which had been triggered by the running of the campaign from the war office rather than from India. Uh, from, 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 from India. And so, for example, we see uh, a great deal of hard work done in rebuilding through uh, the um, in getting the port right in Basra. Uh, all of this made it possible for British troops to begin a, a campaign which basically re re retook Kut, went into Baghdad in March 1917, and by the end of the war, by, by the armistice again with the Turks in October 1918, uh, had effectively occupied what is modern day Iraq. And the army in Mesopotamia was a phoenix risen from the ashes, which Marshall and then, uh, uh, apologies, Maud and then Marshall led to victory. Okay, by, I think these have gone out of sequence. This is what we have, this is, this is Basra. Um, <clears throat> by any standards, men serving in Mesopotamia from 1916 onwards endured a grueling campaign, but they were mostly spared the sufferings of their forebears. It was always going to be bad campaign in somewhere, somewhere like, like, like Iraq. Uh, it was not made unnecessarily worse by incompetence and failures in terms of logistics, medical support and management. And the difference in theatre in Mesopotamia between these two periods of the same theatre was palpable. Um, one young officer of the Royal Warwicks arrived at Basra base in the summer of 1916 and immediately felt there was something wrong with I, IEFD, Indian Expeditionary Force D, the one that was, that was uh, sent to Mesopotamia. Morale was lower than at Gallipoli, where he had served uh, previously and he'd been wounded. At Kurt, the campaign was sunk in stagnant despondency. But by the following spring, this officer wrote, things had changed. Maud was in charge, and there was not a man in the force who did not feel the renewed energy and hope that were vitalizing the whole army. To watch an army recovering its morale is enthralling. To feel the process working within oneself is an unforgivable experience. 
Well, this man was Lieutenant uh, W.J. Slim of the Royal Warwicks. And of course, in the next war, as a general, Uncle Bill Slim was similarly to revive the morale of 14th Army in Burma using many of the same methods as Maud had done in Mesopotamia. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.